Okay, we'll bring our uh, select board meeting to order for January 14th, 2019. Um, first thing to do would be to approve the agenda. Are there any changes or additions? One, one change, um, <clears throat> the library budget we're not going to discuss that tonight. The library commissioners uh, were going to come in tonight for a variety of reasons, mostly to do with me. Um, they're not. They're going to come next Monday. But uh, Nick was very flexible uh, as a recreation director ought to be. Um, and uh, we'll replace the library discussion with a recreation discussion tonight. Um, so. We'll still make progress on budgets, um, but library next week, okay? Perfect. <clears throat> With that change, would somebody like to approve the agenda, please? Make a motion. I'll move that we approve the agenda with the uh, change in the budget item. I'll second that. Okay. Any further discussion? All those approved, say aye. 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 Uh, consent agenda items, the minutes of the January 7th meeting, liquor license for Maplewood Convenience Store, Quinlan Farms, and the Wine Vault, and also signing the Duxbury Fire contract as approved from last week's <coughs> meeting. Be a motion to uh, approve that consent agenda, please. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. I'll second that. Okay. No further discussion on it? All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Public? I think the public must have gone outside for a cigarette because nobody's here. <laughs> here. Alrighty. Uh, we're running a little early. It looks. Um, steel block. That's me, steel block. <laughs> Hey, Bill. Right, thank you. Bill, do we sign both copies? Yes, yes. please. So next thing on the agenda is to, um, a little discussion with John Malter over uh, Ad River Management Resource Alliance, but uh, he's not here just yet. Carol we're said he saw him. So we're a little early, I think. Went out to find him. Right here now. He's right here, Chris. Okay. You're not even going to have a chance to sit down, John. Jeez. <laughs> I was just going by the schedule here. So you can go away, right, right over there. <laughs> Where do you want me? We're hurrying through tonight. Okay. stuff that uh, everybody wants to try and avoid, but has to deal with it on a regular basis. Uh, I've given you two sheets of paper, both sides. Uh, the first sheet is the annual report, which has 
all of our, uh, our uh, information on what we did this past year. And the back side has some additional information about our household hazardous waste collections. And then the second page uh, goes into a little bit on our proposed budget. I wanted to just give you a couple of the highlights of some of the activities we've had and focus a little bit about Waterbury and uh, then take any questions that you might have. Uh, first of all, as always, I think the household hazardous waste collections are the most important part of our function that we provide to the residents within the Med River Resource Management Alliance. And this past year, at our two events over at Harwood, we had 508 households that participated. And of those 508, 200 of them were from Waterbury. So 39.4% uh, of the participants, which just proves that Waterbury has a lot of hazardous waste. Now, it just shows that uh, people are really interested in doing the right thing. and. Uh, that, uh, is a, a good number and the highest number percentage wise of all of our communities and uh, driving out to Harwood it's, uh, it's a good thing to see. Uh, Chris. Real quick John, um, is there a different way of monitoring uh, like the surplus that doesn't go to the hazardous waste? How does that when it comes into the trash dumps or the uh, transfer stations how is it dealt with there? Well, it's uh, not supposed to be going to the, in your regular garbage. Uh, granted, some of it does, uh, but, and periodically they do uh, trash sorts where they literally will open bags to find out what is going in. And that's when we find out, you know, how recalcitrant our residents might be over the year. But to give you an actual number, it's, pretty much impossible to say, but uh, what we find is that uh, uh, we're getting uh, things that go into the recycling bins uh, like batteries. I mean, people do wish recycling, and <laughs> un unfortunately, uh, we, we can take it as has in the hazardous waste collection, but when they put it into the recycling, it winds up being disposed of as uh, as a waste or as a hazardous waste. And so that, that sometimes becomes a problem and can be even more problematic in terms of some of the lithium batteries as potential fire hazards and issues uh, at the material recovery facility for something like that. But uh, this past year, we collected over 27 tons of stuff at our collection and that's uh, the second highest amount we've had in the past six or seven years. So we're definitely getting the word out. Um, and I don't want to jump around, but I think it's appropriate to say that our budget for the first time since 2016 has to uh, be increased uh, because the hazardous waste contractor that we've been using for the last six years has been bought out by a, 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 a venture capital kind of organization. And they have chosen to change their model and they're only doing collection activities in states where their, uh, their facilities are located and they don't have any facilities in Vermont. So we're not the only ones that are losing our, our contractor, but uh, it's created an interesting dilemma for us that uh, back in uh, early November, I put out a request for proposals to four other contractors. And December 7th, I was supposed to have responses in by. And uh, the sound of crickets in my mailbox was uh, very prevalent. We got no responses uh, that day. And I put it out again to two uh, contractors, uh, one of which uh, found their initial response in their spam file. One of the dilemmas of trying to go electronic is that uh, the mailbox, the mail delivers, 
uh, the electrons sometimes don't. But uh, fortunately, we were able to get a successful bid on, uh, from the one contractor. And uh, it's going to be about 20% more than we've had in the past. And so I've raised, uh, and our, my board has approved the draft budget for a 25 cent increase. And that reflects in Waterbury as a $1,266 increase over the, uh, over the per capita. It's a $6.25 versus $6 per capita. So it's 4% over the past three years. So it's not that much of a, of a tremendous amount, but it's more. And it wouldn't be if I could have kept our old contractor. But. So there was that. Uh, food scraps, we had 279 plus tons of food scraps collected commercially within the Alliance communities, plus uh, with the household composting bin program, uh, we collected uh, individually about 16 tons of food scraps. Now, that's not every individual. That's the combined amount of, based on the estimate of the number of bins we have out there and the uh, amount of stuff that was generated. Uh, we also uh, collected over 11 and almost 11 and a half tons of tires this past year, which is over 900 tires, including uh, green up tires, which we take at no charge to the communities as part of our, our ongoing program. And we do the the tires uh, for our residents at a much reduced rate. Uh, uh, this past year, we were doing it at $3 a tire. And uh, those tires wind up going for a combination of either tire-derived fuel or as civil engineering application of uh, chopped up and used for erosion control activities, things like that. Um, it continues to be a, uh, a good program. We also do metal collection in conjunction with the green up activities in the spring. And then in the fall, we, uh, we support the Wheels for Warmth program with some advertising, but uh, we don't have a full collection in the Alliance per se, other than down at the Village uh, Grocery in Waitsfield, they do collect tires there and they go for, uh, you know, some people can buy them and uh, the good ones, or they're also taken away for tire derived fuel or engineering applications. And I should say that at our, uh, down in, at Earthwise in Waitsfield, where we do the majority of the collection, I get people that come in uh, taking away tires, which is really the best thing that we can have people do. It's uh, the best uh, disposal is no disposal. And reuse is the direction we certainly encourage people to go with. So that's been uh, an ongoing activity. Um, E-waste is collected at both the Casella Transfer Station in Waitsfield and over at the state surplus uh, property facility right here in Waterbury. And this past year we collected over 25, notice how I say we, like I'm busy moving all these tons, but it was over 25 tons of computers. That's a lot of cell phones, but no, it's a lot of TVs, monitors, computers, and printers. So when do they do that? E-waste? E-waste? E at, at the, the, at the uh, state, state surplus property? And over at Earthwise, down in down in the, the valley. When? Over the last oh. year. Are they open? Do they take a computer every day of the year? I'm trying to find out. Yeah, they, when. every day when they're open, they're open from I think okay. eight to four. Uh, so you don't have to wait to the five hazardous days. waste no, day or no. anything else. I'm just trying to find. Whenever out. Whenever they're open, and they're right. I think they're open actually uh, Saturdays part part of the day. So as well. old like. Two TVs, can you take those there? And no charge. Okay. And uh, other electronic material you can bring there, but there is a charge. I think it's 
50 cents a pound. So if you've got a bunch of uh, cell phones, that's pretty cheap. So, so is it uh, thanks? Is it financially advantageous for them to, to do that? Is there enough precious metals in, inside those computers? I mean, well, I've been told that they ba basically, tear down and pull off. Yeah, basically, it's a it's a uh, a program. It's part of our product stewardship program. It's a it's a joint. Uh, mainly the manufacturers take back the material and they're covering those costs in either remanufacturing or demanufacturing and taking some of the materials and then processing for new uh, computers. The company that makes the milk runs there, it's bid uh, competitively and the company that's won the bid is out of Middlebury that picks up and takes the things then they sort them by what they are, and they go to whether it's Hewlett Packard or Dell or go on uh, the open market for reuse. You know, some of them are beyond use. Some of my computers are like that. Just get rid of them. Uh, so it's a uh, it's saving on resources. It's preventing stuff from having to come out of the earth, and saving to you know so that we don't have to make quite as many out of raw materials. And that's uh, part of what our, our, our message is and has been. Uh, we, we want to continue to recognize that this is the Mad River Resource Management Alliance, not the Mad River Solid Waste Alliance. And these are resources that just need to be properly so managed. where is this place on route to the state office Surplus property office? Uh, you know where some common is? It's right before that. Oh, okay. And on the right hand side. And uh, you take them around the back. It's not, you go in the front and there's all sorts of surplus. But it's an interesting field trip to go for mm -hmm. if you're looking for office supplies or wondering where all the knives that are confiscated at the airport <laughs> by the TSA people. That's where you'll find them and uh, you can go from there. Um, can, uh, recycling markets have changed and they're probably never going to be the same again. Uh, China, which has been our biggest driver, has uh, entered the 21st century with guns blazing, uh, where the United States, as one of the principal exporters of recycled materials, was routinely able to bring recyclables at a contamination rate up to 10 percent, and it was accepted. Uh, China has now developed their own infrastructure, uh, their own material recovery facilities, their own middle class, generating their own stuff. And uh, over the last year, they have gone to, uh, we don't accept 10%, we don't accept 3%, it's now one half of 1%, which is virtually impossible to meet even at the best of facilities, simply because things get broken and things get mixed in. And so what's happened is that uh, where costs were, uh, based on both material going to China and then the Chinese uh, products such as Apple computers and the like would come back in those same sea containers. They're now having to go to other markets in Southeast Asia, in India, uh, Malaysia and, and the like. And in some cases there isn't the uh, return of products that includes uh, something of value, so the transportation costs effectively have doubled, and that's created a major cost. Uh, the United States and Canada have both recognized that industry, uh, the recycling industry, things like the paper mills that had taken all the uh, used paper uh, recognized when the Chinese market was 
thriving that they couldn't compete effectively. Now that the uh, markets have changed, they're rethinking their processes. And they have already dove into uh, being more efficient at uh, processing waste material. And I think the, the, the numbers that I've seen in the last two years are like in the next in the next two years, we're going to be uh, more independent of the foreign markets and material will be taken here in the uh, North America for processing. So that's been a, you know, where recycling costs were not recognized as a cost to the consumer, even though there were fees associated with it. Uh, now the consumer has been sharing that cost. And uh, that'll probably continue for quite some time, but at least uh, our industries are ramping up to deal with that stuff. Um, those are the major points that I have. Our, like I say, our budget's gone up a quarter from six dollars to six and a quarter. Uh, one of my messages every year is that uh, the select boards always need to approve the budget and uh, authorize uh, your representative. And Alec, unfortunately, and I just had a meeting of my board, and I, I just hadn't given Alec notice in time. He had another commitment tonight, or he would have been here as well. But he's been a fine representative for Waterbury. And uh, I try to have representatives uh, for life so they understand my sense of humor and can go from there. But uh, are there any questions? I guess that would be my, my first question. Any idea in the uh, potential increase in the quantities of uh, food scraps once the law becomes official there that uh, you can't throw food waste in the, in well, the, tra in the trash bag anymore? Uh, well, you know, the. Uh, about 30% of your waste stream is food and food-related material. And uh, you don't have to include meat in the recycling uh, or the, the ban. You can still throw meat products in the trash, uh, which has been, I think, one of the major concerns on the part of residents, that they were going to have to uh, put their uh, leftover ham bones in the recycling bin and would that really work and uh, you know we have green cones that'll deal with digesting that kind of thing but uh, compost bins are really good at bringing out the bears if you're not careful and something like a, a nice smelly piece of meat is a real good attractant so uh, we aren't encouraging that uh, from happening. Uh, but you're going to see an increase in the amount of uh, compost uh, bins at the local level, and you're going to see uh, more commercial uh, collection at uh, transfer stations uh, and material going to uh, commercial uh, composting facilities and alternate uh, uh, anaerobic digestion facilities. So are the seagulls and the crows going to go on strike here? Well, you know, they've been able to share that for quite some time. <laughs> with and, and some people, that's their means of composting. They just spread it out and see who's going to come. It's, it's nice if you want to do Wildlife 101. But somehow, Smokey the Bear and composting are just not compatible. That's one thing. You sell the composting units? I do, we do, the Alliance does. I just conjugated that. Uh, and uh, we also have, uh, uh, I, I do a couple of workshops on composting. I've got one scheduled for the end of April here at the library, uh, which folks are welcome to come to at no charge. If they come to the uh, workshop, 
Uh, there's a reduced price for the compost bins. Uh, but even at full price, the bins are, uh, they've been $52 a piece. And if you go to Costco, that's probably, or Gardner Supply, that's probably half of what they're normally charging. And you can uh, compost up to 650 pounds of uh, food scraps and garden material annually. And, and makes great, great material for your, uh, as a soil amendment. It's good stuff. And I would encourage, you know, the town to be using it with, uh, you know, the plant pots or any kind of landscaping work that's being done. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's good stuff. Uh, the other question that I'm sure is on the tip of everybody's tongue is what, what's going on with RTR uh, in terms of uh, they're not being able to take stuff. And they've had uh, truck problems for the last couple of weeks. They're still working on it. Uh, I'm trying to keep people informed through Front Porch Forum and uh, they're still taking redeemable bottles and cans, but in the interim, uh, if during the week people need to have a disposal option for trash or recyclables, they can go up to Stowe or down to uh, Earthwise and on Saturday over to uh, Rodney's over behind Crossroads. But that's where that's at right now. Got a question for John Ann? Yeah, what are, what's happening with uh, rags and cloth? Textiles? Textiles. Right now, nothing. Uh, you can take it up to Stowe. There will be a charge. Uh, when we lost the, uh, the landfill, we lost a lot of leverage in terms of having a spot to stockpile stuff. but. Uh, Goodwill Industries takes trailer loads, tractor trailer loads of material. If the town of Waterbury was interested in spotting a tractor trailer, uh, it would still cost something to get rid of this stuff, but uh, that's the challenge, is that uh, the markets are up and they're down. And we're, as a couple of years back when the landfill was operating, they were uh, paying 15 cents a pound uh, for some of the textiles, and now it's about a penny a pound. And when you factor in the cost of trucking and all the infrastructure associated with that, it just isn't economically viable. So that's where that's all at. All right. Thank you. I'm, I'm on the Garden Club. Maybe the Garden Club should buy one of these compost bins so that when they do the weeding of all those beds in the village. They, instead of leaving plastic bags, they could. Uh... Yeah, I'm actually doing a, a workshop with the river runs through it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate your time, John, like always. Yeah, my pleasure, Chris. So you need a motion for them to appoint Alec? Is that what you said? I need two motions, one for your budget, our budget, and one for your representative. But so sure. a motion to approve paying six and a quarter per capita. Right. Or if you want to mo move to 650 or seven dollars and a trip for me to Hawaii or Acapulco <laughs> so I could check out some new compost bins. Okay. So if somebody would like to make a motion to increase our budget amount to uh, Mad River Solid Waste. No! Or, uh, Mad River Resource Management Alliance. Thank you. From the current amount to six dollars and twenty-five cents. That correct? That's correct. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the amount of six dollars and twenty-five cents for the budget as just described by Chris. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Any other questions from anybody? All those who wish to approve, say aye. 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 And uh, the second motion was, remind me again. Appoint somebody to be okay. the representative. Appoint uh, Alec. Alec Tuscany for the ensuing year for, uh, uh, boy, 
Representative. Representative of uh, Don't say Waterbury. It. <laughs> Representative <laughs> Waterbury. <laughs> Bad River Resource Management Bad Alliance. Alliance. I'll make a motion to appoint Alec Tuscany as a Waterbury representative to the Mad River Re Resource Management Alliance. And Bill Woodruff as the alternate. And Bill Woodruff as the alternate. Second that. Don't want you to lose a job. Yeah. Ho hoping there's no further discussion. Uh, the, only, <laughs> the only point of this is that normally you have to be absent to get appointed to something like this. Uh, glad to see that you're here. Well, I'm happy they want out for life. <laughs> <laughs> You become the alternate for life then. <laughs> okay, motion's been made and seconded. All those who approve, say aye. 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 Very, good. Very good, John. And you keep saying Mad River Resources. Ah, uh, you know, it's hard to get it out of your head. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Bill. <clears throat> we start with Nick, do we? Yeah, so I'm going to pass uh, two packets to you. Um, first of all, I just want to tell the select board I apologize. Um, that's the budget, and then this is some background for the parks portion of the budget, which is really serious. Um, so I apologize that I was not able to send any budgets or um, memos to you over the weekend. I'm sure that you were crying that you didn't have to read anything over the weekend from me. Um, unfortunately, I just, with uh, having to be away last weekend for personal reasons um, and other meetings that I've had, library meetings and EFUD meetings, I just was not able to uh, get quite as much done as I would like. Also, um, you know, I like to transmit good news, and so far the news is that, you know, costs, not costs so much, but uh, paying for the costs are, are going up some. Anyway, by next Monday's meeting, uh, I, I will have plenty of emails to you, so don't fret that you're going to miss out on all that good stuff. Anyway, um, Nick is here, uh, and the we have a two-page or a back-to-back -back page: um, pool, recreation programs, rec administration, and parks. Uh, the parks budget is a collaborative effort, really, between uh, Nick a little bit and mostly Celia. We'll talk about the parks budget uh, right now while Nick is here at the head table, uh, and then after we're done with the rec in the parks, then Celia and Bill Woodruff will help with the um, highway budget, which I'll pass out in a minute. So um, the first thing that I'd like you to notice, I pointed this out a little bit last week, but if you go to this second page, so that's the page with rec administration and parks <coughs> budget on it, at the bottom <coughs> you can see um, an un labeled line that has 247,695 in it. That's the, that's the net expense for these four uh, budgets from 2018. So all the expenses uh, and all the revenues, add the revenues together, add the expenses together. And in 2018, we thought the net expense for the, these four programs was going to be 247,695. I explained to you last week when we met that we took in more revenue than we anticipated. Uh, some costs were a little lower than anticipated as well. So the net expense really uh, was 228,848. So we had a little bit lower, less expense than we planned on last year. And right now, if you just passed all of this and it got approved by the town meeting, the net expense for 2019 is 252,775. So that's up, you know, about 25,000 from the actual, but it's only up about uh, 5,100, not even 5,100 from last year's budget. So that's about a 2% increase on the net, and that's kind of right in line with inflation. So with that. Um, 
roundup of kind of the net numbers. I'll turn it over to Nick and he can talk about programs and pools and administration a little bit and then he can answer some questions. All right. Um, I just wanted to do a quick overview first of um, like a recap of this past year, um, my time here this past year. Um, so the summer was successful with the summer camp, um, the mini camps that did run in the pool. Um, the pool had over 200 memberships sold um, and offered uh, four sessions of swim lessons that were at 50% capacity or more. Um, moving into the fall and winter, I renewed our partnership with First and Fitness in Berlin. It's a, a, they have a pool and some workout equipment. Um, Deb had put that in place before to give them 15% of whatever income we took in offering some lessons there. Um, I thought that was great, so we redid it. Um, and subsequently, we had 15 kids sign up this fall for swim lessons compared to four last fall. Um, this winter, we ran another eight-week session, and we had 41 sign up compared to 20 last year. Um, I think the increase is in part due to some marketing through the new Facebook page, uh, front porch forum, probably seeing them all over there. Um, I like posters, some radio advertisements, etc. Um, for events, uh, we did a Halloween in the park for the first time. Shaw's donated the candy. Um, we had over 200 trick or treaters, even though it was a rainy night. Um, we also helped out with River of Lights, which we had a lot of positive feedback on. It was my first time with any sort of event that involved lanterns in a road, so it was pretty cool. Um, uh, and then, you know, I was planning with Winterfest helping with a couple events that Rec will be um, included in. But um, we also ran a kids' night out uh, the 21st, just kind of an idea of, of parents maybe want to get their kids watched after school into the evening while they do last minute Christmas shopping. Um, it was kind of uh, a dud. We had low enrollment. It was pouring that night, and half of our planning was outdoor activities using the ice rink and whatnot. Um, but we're hopeful to try running it again, see maybe if we get better enrollment, we plan a little differently. Pair it up with maybe an adult event happening in town where they would like their kids watched or not. So Nick, was it a dud in the respects that nobody showed up or a dud in the respects that the rain kind of washed out everything? Um, or both? Both. We, we had people show up, but not nearly what we wanted. Um, and then the rain kind of put a damper on things. I mean, it's uh, what the idea is, is to provide a, a low cost uh, child care service so that parents can go out to dinner, go out shopping, what have you. I mean, um, what was the price that you had for it? It's very reasonable. Yeah, it was 30 bucks and it was for seven hours and I had Shaw's, they donated the meal, like so provided it was food. So $30 for up to seven hours, including yep. a meal. Including so. a meal. And we did tons of crafts we sent them home with, so. Um, That's a long time. It is. That's pretty good. It was a long time. They don't have to stay, they don't have to stay seven hours if they don't want to. Yeah. One, did, so, one did, so. So maybe you want to make it five hours. Yeah, something. and less cookies, because that was, yeah. So we'll restructure it. I'll make it, you know, shorter. You I'll do like four hours, which, you know, yeah. the price I thought was on point, but with fewer hours, it means we'll have maybe fewer costs involved. get some feedback from some parents. Yeah. What yeah. they would like. Um, so I'm hoping to run that in the future again. Um, Parents that did show up loved it, so, and the kids. Um, moving forward into 2019, um, I've kept, for the winter and spring, I've, I'm keeping slash planning on keeping uh, the same programming that was ran last year. Um, so that includes the vacation camps uh, in February and April for kids um, on school break to have a mini camp for the week. Again, it's affordable childcare, theoretically. Um, we're going to keep winter and spring swim lessons um, and the lifeguard recertification classes that you were scheduled last spring. We're going to keep those. In addition, um, I've partnered with some other instructors to offer more programming. So this, uh, actually this past Tuesday, we started uh, the women's self-defense course, which is four weeks. Um, we're offering three four-week karate courses for adults, children, and then one for parents and children at Green Mountain Dojo. Um, which is up the road at the intersection of um, Snow Fire. Mm -hmm. I'm still learning my buildings here. but um, And then we're offering two four-week uh, ukulele classes. So 
Um, there's just some interesting new programming that I'm trying to add. Um, Has anybody signed up for that yet? Yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. I was I was kind of interested in that. The instructor is. Uh, there's still room. Awesome. Yes, there's still room. I might take it. So. Um, and then finally, uh, for this summer, I have um, expanded day camp from kindergarten. It was kindergarten through fourth grade. I've expanded it kindergarten through seventh grade. Um, the main reason being when I first got here and ever since, people are asking, why can't you have more space and why can't you offer it to older children? Um, the reason that it was brought down to fourth grade is because there's only 80 spaces available it's to safely house at the rec building. And um, you know, four, fifth and four, sixth graders could probably watch themselves better than a fourth or third grader can. Mm -hmm. So they shorten it to, to expand the seats to those folks. Um, for this uh, camp, I have worked uh, with Skip Flanders and um, have booked the, I'm calling it the community room at the bottom of the Methodist Church. Uh, it's a large basement. It's actually bigger than the rec building, and it's got a way nicer kitchen and bathrooms. But um, we're going to do kindergarten through third grade at the rec building um, with 80 spots. So that should alleviate some of the stress that parents are already emailing me about space and whatnot. And then fourth through seventh grade will go um, to the Methodist church. Um, and there's 40 spots available there. Skip's flexible on that. If we get an influx of people, I can, I can up it a little bit. Um, that means we're going to have to hire a few more staff to make sure that we're staffed at both locations. Um, but ultimately, it's the same camp, just at a different location. In the afternoons, they will all swim at Anderson. Um, they'll utilize the same lunch program at the senior center. Um, and the field trips, they will go together so everyone gets the same opportunity for the price. So just stop there for a second. So if you look at your program's budget, you'll notice that first line, summer program pay, we budgeted 47,250 last year. We actually spent uh, about 51,300. Um, and the budget this year is 69,120. And that's because of that additional camp that Nick yep. just explained. Um, and you can see the revenue for the camp last year. We budgeted 53,000, we took in 53,000. And the budget this year is for eighty thousand. Um, and I, I just want you to understand where some of these additional expenses are going to show up. Um, and the one thing that I'll say is that, you know, uh, a number of years ago, probably, man, when was how long ago was Jessica the leader of the? Record? Remember? Oh, Long time, right? Ten, yeah. Anyways, probably 15 years ago, we tried to open a uh, camp for middle school age kids. We did it at Crossett Brook. And uh, it takes a little time for something new to catch on. And the select board, when we did that, said, yeah, we'll do it, but it needs to pay for itself. And it didn't the first year, and then they canceled it. And this is really the first opportunity that we're trying again. And I'll just say up front that while we hope that just like last year, we'll have enrollment to cover the expenses of it, there's a minimum number of staff people that yeah. is going to need to run that program. And if we're thinking that you know we can break even at 30, and I, I'm not trying to put numbers in his mouth because I don't know the number, but if we end up with 20, we still have to run the program. And there's a possibility it could lose a little money. And uh, we can reevaluate it at the end of the year. But I'm just letting you know up front that uh, we've tried to, to show costs that we think we're going to have. And we've tried to be a little bit conservative on the revenues. If we get what we're thinking, we'd be OK. But I just want to explain that there could be a little bit of a lag. And I'd like to add, too, that some of these costs, um, like for instance, under programs and new equipment, um, it increased $2,000. That's just a one-year increase because the camps, this camp has no, no equipment, no sports equipment, whatnot. 
um, a lot of these other lines, um, they're reflected. So if there's, if there's fewer enrolled, that means there's fewer shirts we have to buy, which means safety wear and clothing will, won't be as much, so um, as an example. Um, so it's, a, it's yeah, not so all these are going to be set, some, even some if we... The, some of the yeah. lines, if there's not enrollment, you know, we won't have the expense and we won't have the revenue. But when you're planning on a five-day-a-week program, you've got to have enough staff. people to cover the program. And how many staff do you think you're going to need down there? Uh, six. Okay. So we're going to hire six people, and six people, you know, if we get 30 or 40, that's a, a good um, ratio. If we get 15, we still have six people that yeah. I'd really rather not have to tell them that we're not going to pay you this right. summer, <laughs> you know. So just beware that it's a go-slow process. You've experienced interest, though, in expanding this program. Definitely, and, yeah. And the thing about it is kids from year to year, they get older each year. Right. And uh, I, I think with the, the group that is already your customer base, um, as, as they grow on, if we get the option available, um, I, I think it'll populate yeah. itself once it moves along. That's the hope, yeah. I think it's also helpful that it's going to be right in the village as opposed to at Cross the Brook, you know, in terms of getting them to the <clears throat> swimming pool and things like that a lot easier. Um, lunches and the, and the like, so. Yeah, I think, I think my daughter actually was in that Cross at Brook Middle School program. She did some amazing things. Um, they, went, they went to a cave and went cave exploring, which is a little scary for me. And um, yeah, they were also exploring bat, the whole uh, learning about bats, and they built bat houses. Oh, okay, that's kind of cool. So um, did, you, did I understand that you were going to have the same activities as the younger kids? Yeah, so the, the structure is um, the, the mornings will be focused more towards the age groups um, because, let's face it, a sixth or seventh grader is going to want to do the same thing as a kindergartner. Um, so K through three will do their own activity in the morning, activities. Um, five or four through seven will do their own activities. They'll probably use this field because it's the biggest field, unless it's raining and they can do things in the church. Um, but uh, in the afternoons is when we usually swim, um, and so that's just going to be all camp um, sometime. Um, uh, also, the, sometimes we do activities like some sort of basketball game or something on the field, capture the flag. Um, so that's, that's all camp activities, and the reason marketing it as, you know, it's K through 7 is because we want the kids that are in fourth grade moving up to be, okay, this is going to be this similar rec that we're used to. Yeah. Um, so they'll go on field trips together. All our field trips are geared towards those ages. So. OK. Well, you also have social media that you didn't have 15 right. years ago. So. Right. That'll help. That'll help, yeah. Um, and then so I guess just tied to the, OK, well, actually, real quick, the mini camps. Um, we're slated to run 13 mini camps throughout the summer. Um, they're at, they include athletic camps, uh, hiking, fishing camps, camping camps. Um, and science camps. Um, there's potential to add a few more, but I'm still ironing out the details. Um, for instance, if these karate classes that are working or that are scheduled for this winter work out, then you know they're willing to partner with us for the summer. So, um, tied to summer camp, um, I also would like to propose a new fee. Um, as of now, I mean, even with the proposed fees, we're still want to be like the lowest option for childcare in. The area. Um, this past summer, it was 650 for eight weeks and 700. So 650 for residents, 700 for non-residents um, for all eight weeks. I'm proposing we raise it by 50 dollars to 700 and 750 um, for resident and non-residents. Um, that's still less than 100 dollars a week for childcare uh, for eight and a half hours a day um, for eight weeks in the summer. So I think that's. Still low, but it's a reasonable increase without making families uh, upset. Is is that adjustment built into your projected numbers? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And that adjustment is to make the the program more. Um, Funding itself better. Yeah, yeah. Minimum rate, minimum, minimum wage increased a little bit. Um, other expenses increased, so it's, it's to help even that out. Mm -hmm.
questions? If you flip the page over, the REC administration budget, which is basically the budget that we pay Nick from, um, you know, you'll see that's down about 5,400 from last year. About half of the 5,400 is um, in the regular pay line. Um, it's gone down from 46 to 43.4. Not so much because Nick is making uh, less money than Deb did. Uh, it's very comparable, actually. But in 18, we budgeted for some overlap. There was a time that you know Deb was going to be here, and then Nick was going to be here as well. So it's just Nick for 12 months. So there's a little savings there. Um, some of the other lines are just directly related to the payroll line, you know, Social Security, retirement, et cetera. Um, the telephone, internet line is down a little bit, uh, about, what is it, $1,300. Um, I told you last week we put a new phone system in. Um, so I think that's a, a good number. Um, the computer services line is uh, down a little bit from what we budgeted. Again, that was somewhat related there. So I think on that budget, we're pretty good. Uh, there's really not any, uh, anything real big to review there. On the parks budget, uh, Celia's here, um, and Nick is here. Celia, why don't you come up and sit next to Nick? Because we're gonna go to your budget, the highway budget soon anyway. <clears throat> So I'll just start off on the <clears throat> on the regular pay for parks and the part-time pay for parks. Uh, there's a little bit of savings there last year. Um, last year, the the regular pay line uh, we spent almost twenty-four thousand dollars, and I carried twenty-four thousand dollars there. Uh, we hired uh, Dylan Haskins in the highway department last year. He gets his pay posted to the highway department from January 1st through about April 15th, and then it's posted for, to the uh, regular pay in the parks line from April through the end of October, maybe into November a little bit, then he switches back to, to highway. So the $24,000 there for the regular pay parks is comparable to last year, should be fine. The part-time pay line is down a little bit. The $25,000 last year, I didn't talk to Bill yet about this, so maybe he's going to cringe. But um, last year, we actually had budgeted for two people to serve in that position. We ended up only being able to hire one. Um, they got the job done, I think. So I just <coughs> carried the, the amount of money for the one person now. So. We didn't talk about that earlier today. I didn't think about it until right now. Uh, if you want somebody else, we'll have to figure it out. But um, do you need more than one part-time person if the person's working? We we were fortunate we had a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Brad's getting that. I mean, if we don't get Brad back again, and we hire another one, it's, it's not necessarily going to pan out the same way. Um, I mean, there were times where they were, the weather cooperated with them. So um, if we had had a very fast growing season, they wouldn't have been able to keep up as well. Yeah. So it's, there's a lot of factors to it. While they did a good job with the season we had with just the two of them, will it continue on yeah. to this year? Was it dry? We had dry weather, so it yeah. didn't grow as much. That's true. Um, the 25,000, the, the two people, and I don't remember the numbers, but we had one person that was like from April to the end of October, and then the other part of the budget was more for summertime. And we had the six-month person in Brad. We didn't hire the other person. So I think we can live with this budget. If we have to hire somebody else and we overspend, we'll overspend. But I don't want to necessarily add anything to this, but just be aware. It's a little bit shaved back for that reason, and I had forgotten about the dry weather, so uh, sorry about that. What uh, type of basic same work schedule type or work type of chores 
mowing and just yeah so so Dylan Dylan when he switches over to the parks and, and you know Randy had done this for years and years and years and now when we hired Dylan we put Dylan in the parks and Randy's able to do some more things on the highway department of of concrete work and stuff Randy's pretty good at, at that um, but it's the some of the pay is in this parks line and and they, they obviously take care of mowing. They take care of trash removal in the parks. Do they do any of the line striping? Yes. Yep. So they put out the line striping. Um, it's paid out of a different budget. They mow the cemeteries. Um, and that, that's not included in this, you know, 18565 and 24000 There's more money in the cemetery budget. Mm -hmm. But they mow the cemeteries. <coughs> Am I missing anything? What else do they do? Sometimes traffic pick up stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. all, just, all odd jobs that maintenance of yeah. the buildings. Um, they clean the bathrooms. A little paint and do some painting. A um, little bit of this, a little bit of that. Repairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So um, the only line that's really important. Uh, for you to talk about with Celia is the grounds maintenance line in the parks budget. Um, and we, we budgeted 19250 last year. Uh, we spent not quite sixteen. And if I remember correctly, Celia, um, I you, uh, small you budgeted <coughs> it or not? It no, it's not there. How much did you budget for that line item? That about before. The ground ground maintenance? Yeah. What what I want for it? Yeah, what did you budget? Like, for this year? For 2019. Um, I, I'm looking for 29. That's on the sheet. Yeah. So I gave you that sheet. Yeah. Yeah, you're you the only one that got it? No. no. Everybody's got yeah, it except me, right? <laughs> okay. Gave yours away. So anyway, thank you. So, um, Celia budgeted $29,340. Um, one of the reasons I bumped it down was because we budgeted $19,250 last year and we didn't spend sixteen. dollars So, um, I'm looking for money to save in the budget, so I, I lowered it some. Um, if you look at that page, on the second page, you see the above are a must for normal operations, and there's a number 16,540 there. Mm -hmm. And that $16,540 takes care of uh, Hardigan, uh, Myers, bags, paint, toilet paper, paper towels, cleaning supplies, dog station, replacement bags, and the like. All that adds up to 16540 I'm going to talk to him about Hardigan a little bit and the changes that are happening and the requests that you have. But, well, we're encountering a large increase from our portalette, um, portalettes. Um, for the last five years, when they were Hardigans, they've kept the, the price per month the same for the last five years. Unfortunately, this year, under new management, our prices have almost doubled. Um, and we have talked about with the, the use of the parks are becoming um, heavier, so they're being used a lot more. So instead of once a week is what we've been doing it, we wanted to start cleaning them twice a week, which have unfortunately increases the, the price of the portalettes. Um, and we've, two years ago, 
or last year we started using a handicap portalette at Hope Davy because they don't have mm -hmm. anything to that. And Dak Row does not either, so we we would like to introduce another handicap portalette for the Dak Row facility. Um, we don't need one at Anderson because of the Scout Hall. So, but with the additional and the handicap ones are are very very expensive, um, especially if we do them twice a week. So the, there's a, a huge increase. We were paying I think this year. 410 a month for once a week cleaning for the five portalettes. Um, now we're looking at um, almost $1,100 a month for twice a week mm -hmm. and the additional portalette. But with the regulations for bathrooms at our facilities, since we don't meet them at the DAC row one, um, we really need to introduce the, the handicap portalette at this point until we decide to do something on a more um, stationary project. How many months do they have the portalettes in? The portalettes we, we put out the 1st of May, and we have them taken up um, the, the last day of October. So I guess my question would be uh, the fees that we're charging. I'm wondering if our costs are Pacing. Yeah, you. <clears throat> um, I inherited the fee structure that you guys approved um, in 2016, and it goes until this next year. Um, there's a slight increase, uh, but we will probably definitely need to revisit those fees until in, at the end of 2019 to implement a new uh, increased fee structure for years moving forward, especially with increases like this. Yeah, we. Because everything's increasing. I mean, our trash and recycling is increasing because they can't get rid of it cheap enough. Um, even even our trash bags, um, they've I've already been told from my supplier that they're going up 20 plus percent because of the Terrace. tariffs. Um, same way with the dog bags. I mean, we spend um, a, quite a few dollars on providing yeah. dog bags. Um, which I think is a good idea because other than that. Well, they don't hang them in the trees like I'm told they do. Well, they do. I mean, it's, most people tend to are able to put them where they need to go, but occasionally not. But um, so it is the, the, just the general operation fees for the parks is, is um, gone up quite a bit this year. And as we know, it's going to go up every year. But the portalettes are a big, and we looked at other changing suppliers, and unfortunately, Hardigan was still the cheapest. Um, they're the closest, and anybody else would have almost doubled that again. So, I mean, you had reasonably good service from them, right? Up until last year, yes. Like they got bought out. Yeah, once they, they got bought out and changed, they, their service has not been quite so well, so we did look at going somewhere else, but with the pricing of what we're hoping to do with the twice a week, um, it's, it's it, the, the cost would be a lot more if we went with somebody else. So. Yeah. Okay. So, the 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 ask from Celia was twenty nine thousand three hundred and forty. Sixteen five forty of it is really kind of fixed costs, and that's where. We've, we've been through that. So that's the hydrogen, it's recycling, uh, cleaning supplies, and the like. So from the 16540 down uh, to where it says equipment maintenance and bold, uh, those are more, um, uh, they're not, I don't want to say variable, they're discretionary. We don't have to do any of that, uh, but there's some things that we need to do there. Um, I don't know if your copies have the line through the $1,000 for the Hope Davy Park yeah. expansion. Yeah. Okay. So I've taken that out. Um, we've got a number of dead trees in the Maple Street uh, parking lot at Hope Davy, right? <coughs> and we've got to take those trees out. They, they're dead and dying. And since we're going to do that, Nick <clears throat> asked if we could expand the parking lot. As you know, especially Jane, you live right there. Uh, that parking lot, it gets over it's over, overflows. 
Um, I took the thousand dollars out for expanding the parking lot this year because we haven't designed it yet, and we're going to need a permit. We probably need an amendment to our Act 250 permit. So we're going to. I just found out about that really today. So we may take the trees down, which there won't be a. If you cost take the trees that, down, you could remove the fence, and people could park on the grass. Yes. Yeah. But temporarily, we're, we're, so we'll deal with the parking lot later, and then the two thousand uh, dollars. Is there a question mark next to the two thousand dollars for the Rusty Parker Park? Yeah. Okay. So, the Rusty Parker Park um, playground there. The Rotary Club is actually doing a project right now to try to come up with some of this money. Um, I'm going to take that out of this, and and you know there may be some. We're going to have to be involved, but I think um, that two thousand dollars was to do what? We got to put a path in there, or a path in there to the for handicap accessibility. We have to do that. Mulch, like the yeah, the, I guess the path, and then the mulch to redo the whole. Um, there's just dirt there now, so, and then whatever the, if we so were doing concrete. So the project may be done. There, if if the project goes forward, we'll have a little involvement with it. It may or may not cost two thousand dollars, but, um, I just I just added, you know, about five thousand dollars to the sixteen five as opposed to adding, you know, thirteen thousand. And that's how I got to the twenty two. So that's. The soft number on the page, I told Celia and Bill this afternoon that, like every year, we have to do what we'll have to do. Um, I'd, I'd rather, sometimes, as, as counterintuitive as it, as it sounds, I would almost rather have a line item be overspent by $3,000 than consistently underspent by three or $4,000, because every year we we budget, you know, last year we budgeted, um, we budgeted 19.250. We only spent 15.7. And if you look back, when we do that on a consistent basis, you're raising money and you're not spending it. I'd rather sometimes have a, you know, a little bit less. And if we go over, it's not that big a deal because you're going to raise the tax this year if you put it in. So anyway, um, any additional questions? It's really only that one line item, but you have any real discretion so, in the parts. <clears throat> okay, so ten thousand dollars more for uh, the parks and the ground maintenance, which I think you very clearly demonstrated the need for that. And then you've cut some of these other items. So, well, what would you say the final so was? The 20, number that I've given on this 22? page is 22. Okay, so it's it's about it's more than seven thousand dollars less than Celia asked for. Um, and it's not that I don't trust her numbers, but as I said, if you look back, there are line items that we underspent. So we can adjust this next week or the week after if we have to. I mean. Ultimately, we'll come back together when we have reviewed all the budgets and do a, a major reshuffling and a consolidation if we have to. But right now, I plug this number in because I know what's happening in other departments and other areas, and I'm trying to find places to save a little bit. And we're not going to talk about the uh, recreation CIP tonight. Uh, we may touch on the highway CIP a little bit, but we'll have to come back to that as well. I haven't had a chance to put that all together yet. So I'm ready to move on, Chris, unless yeah. you folks have specific, like, you have to do something different. For now, you're all set? Okay. So Nick, you're welcome to stay as long as you like, but you're, you're like off the hot seat now. <laughs> Sorry, my filter phone. Um, are you going in for your last manager's item? Or are you going into the executive session? Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you can pass that along. We'll get to that eventually. Oh, yeah. I just need one, Carla. I think there's enough. Mike's turned on. You can pass. Take one and pass one of those along. Yep. <laughs> okay, so if you start with this page, <clears throat> the one that the highway budget is on, um, I'll just do a little bit of an overview, hit some of the high points. <clears throat> Four low points, and then uh, we can turn to Celia and Bill a little bit. Um, so the first thing that I want to tell you is that if you look at the first two columns, the budget of 2018 and the actual of 2018, um, there's a few changes that I've made. If you looked at the accounting software, the, the expenditures would be a little bit higher than they're showing here. So for example, uh, if you look at the retirement pay line, it's in kind of bold blue font, and it says uh, 20068 I'm probably going to move some of that retirement, that 20068 out of this budget, um, not because I want to, you know, do something uh, underhanded, but I told you before that uh, Dylan worked in the Parks Department in the summer months, so I'm going to move the retirement for Dylan, which is all showing up in this 20068 right now. I'm going to move some of that off to the Parks budget. <clears throat> the new equipment line down at the bottom of that same column, well, <clears throat> the fuel gas line, I'm sorry, right in the middle of the page. If you look at that fuel gas line, um, that, and I'm not sure right now whether I, I put that in blue uh, to, to move some of it or if I already have. I think I already have moved some of it. I think the year-end number in the highway department was around $7,000. I moved some of that gas to the cemetery fund, and I moved a little bit more of it to the parks department. The, the parks department had a gas expense, but I don't think it was quite right. <clears throat> so I'm, so that number is different than it would look like if you looked at the accounting software right now. <clears throat> and then the new equipment line, and I'll ask Bill this if he remembers. Um, the new equipment line there, Bill, um, if you look at the Memric software right now, it says like 5,600. Mm -hmm. It was a piece of equipment last year that you bought, Celia, that was going to be split between the three departments and this. 1921 is really a third of that, so I, I think I gotta, you know, I, I gotta move or have the other two departments pay the highway department back. So that I believe is the real number. Um, if you go up to the revenues at the top of the page, uh, about four lines down, you'll see the Wasi fuel line. Uh, there's a three thousand dollar budget uh, to date. Wasi has paid us $6,268. There's another like $480 that we just build them that will be added to that number. So that is going to go up a little bit. Um, if you look over to the right in that same line to where it says budget 2019, I'm thinking that I want to make that line zero, not because I don't want WASI to pay us back anymore, but I think rather than having a, a revenue line show up there and then have to look at the expense line and then remember to, to uh, net out the revenue, mm -hmm. when WASI pays us starting in 2018, I'm going to just credit the expense line. So if we paid 
$10,000 for diesel fuel and WASI paid us $1,000. What we use is actually showing on the expense line. It's just a little cleaner. Mm -hmm. um, the reason the diesel fuel for us is up as high as it is, and it may actually go higher if we get uh, another bill at the end of the month. Um, you know, winter lasted a lot longer. It, it was winter well into April last year. You remember, Chris, because you were going to do a job at my house and you had to wait. Mm -hmm. uh, and then winter started in November, even though it warmed up just before Christmas. We had January weather in November and December. Um, Wasi, the reason they used more fuel than we budgeted is, A, the prices were probably higher than they were. The fuel prices moved up. Uh, a little higher than they had in previous years. But Wasi's fuel use is not related at all to the winter, really, except there might be a few more accidents that they have to go to. Their, their fuel is dependent upon how many times 911 rings and they have to go out. So I think um, I'm going to take the revenue out of there and just net it out in the expense line, and it will be a truer cost of what we're spending and it will be easier going forward. Um, but how do you how do you tell what Wasi paid us then? Well, we'll I'll be able to I'll be you can look at the detail in that expense line and there there'll be lots of payments to Borns for the fuel and then there'll be twelve payments from Wasi awesome. to us and you won't see it here so you won't be as able as quickly to say, you know, 65,000 minus 6,200 equals, you know, 59,000. But the information will still be available. It's just that I kind of like to have a, an idea of what's happening in our department that we control as opposed to what somebody else is doing. So anyway, the 2019 budget, um, <coughs> We'll start in the expenses. Uh, so the regular pay line you see is up $14,500 from what we budgeted last year. And it's up about $10,000 from what we spent. Uh, remember, we hired Dylan in 2018, uh, the new employee. So uh, you know he was being paid in the part-time pay line for the first uh, three and a half months of the year. He, you know, we didn't hire him full time until uh, after 30 days past town meeting and then almost right away he started being paid out of the parks department. So this budget reflects a full year of, of eight highway employees as opposed to uh, seven. Um, moving down, the part-time pay is lower and it's lower because um, uh, Dylan now is a full-time employee. We still do have part-time people working right now. Unfortunately, between the water department, the sewer department, and the highway department, we've had lots of people who have been out on extended leaves. And we've got a part-time person, Brad Roy, that we were talking about as the summer employee is still working right now um, and he's working and being paid out of the highway department but the water department's paying uh, their share of his time. Uh, you know, Celia was out twice last year with two uh, serious medical uh, situations um, in the water department, which is part of EFUD. Uh, Matt Hunt is on paternity leave. He's just starting to come back now, uh, but we needed to cover that time. Uh, and now I just found out today that one of our highway employees uh, got hurt on the job a couple weeks ago, or a month and a half ago maybe, but hasn't been responding to uh, physical therapy, and uh, when's he got to have surgery? Next Tuesday and he's gonna be out for six weeks. So, um, you know, we'll save a little pay because that will be a workers' compensation um, claim and, and he'll get his compensation through workers' comp. Might take a little sick time. Uh, 
but what that translates to is that we've got to have part-time people work a little bit more, and then the full-time people have to pick up the slack, so we ended up paying more overtime last year than we would have, even if the winter hadn't been extra long, the fact that one person is out means that other people have to step up. So the 364, 500 is my best uh, projection right now. Um, it'll be close, it won't be exact, it never is. Mm. Same with the part-time pay. Um, the health insurance is, you know, that's just, uh, again, it's up because Dylan uh, took health insurance. We didn't have him last year at all, so part of his health insurance gets paid out of the Parks Department as well. Um, then the rest of the lines, disability, Social Security, retirement, uh, those are all payroll uh, related, to kind of direct correlation to payroll, so they're going to go up a little bit. Unemployment insurance, uh, we're up a little bit. Um, that's just kind of, uh, unfortunately, the way unemployment works is that if you had somebody working for you three years ago and then they leave and then they go to a different employer and then they get laid off, you get a share of their costs. So even though we haven't laid anybody off for a long time, uh, we, we, you know, that's credited to our experience and we've had a little worse experience. And we and it's also tied to payroll. So uh, you pay our unemployment rate, I think is, uh, it's based on $15,300 worth of base pay and it's about 1.001%. So it, it's, it's not much, but it is somewhat tied to payroll. <clears throat> workers' compensation is going up a lot, and workers' compensation is going up a lot for three reasons. One, it's tied to payroll, so as your payroll increases, um, you know, the highway department has <clears throat> the second highest rate. I think it's about, if I remember right, about $9.75 per $100 worth of payroll, so you take your payroll, which is about $370,000, you divide it by 100, and then you multiply that by 9.75, I think, or maybe it's 5.75. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's the second highest rate. Only uh, water and sewer have a higher rate than, than highway folks. And then the second um, reason why it's going up is that we've had lousy experience the last several years. Uh, we've had a fair number of pretty high um, workers' comp claims, not just in the highway department, but we get looked at it as a town-wide, and then, you know, our, we, get a, we get an insurance bill. <clears throat> we've had uh, people in the highway department out on workers' comp. We've had people in the library department out on workers' comp. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, a number of little injuries every single year. But um, we've, the last couple of years, we've had, I know of at least four people who have been, not only had medical expenses, which can be high, but who have actually missed time. And the missed time is where things really get driven up. So. Um, you know, you got to pay your premium, and that's that's what happened. So that's up significantly. <clears throat> and then moving down the line, uh, you know, there's not anything else that jumps out at me until you get down to building maintenance. Why don't you to explain the building maintenance on this sheet that you have that I passed out? All of the line items that. Celia has. We don't have to go over it now. You certainly can if you want. But um, just like I did with the uh, <clears throat> with the grounds maintenance line in the parks budget, some of these line items, you know, Celia has asked for a higher amount of money than I put in the budget, and she and I and Bill went over those this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> 
they understand. They might not agree with what I've put on the paper here, but they understand why I've done it. Some of the some of the time, it's because they asked for an amount last year and we didn't come close to spending it, and the, and the amount that we're asking for this year is higher. And I don't I don't uh, blame them for that. They're they're trying to look at unit prices and costs and what they think they might have to buy, but. A budget is a budget, and some line items are going to be overspent, and some are going to be underspent. So anyway, <clears throat> if you have questions about any of the line items in the 2019 column, at your leisure, you can look at this page and just understand that there might be numbers on this page that are different than the numbers on my page, and I just explained why. But on building maintenance, um, that's a a fairly decent jump, 6,400 over what we budgeted last year. So I don't need to explain what's going on there. Well, um, <clears throat> talked about starting to try and do more maintenance on our buildings. Um, we haven't really put a lot of, like, painting the buildings, looking at um, redoing some siding. Um, so we... Um, looked at a few smaller projects like the highway garage is probably close to 20 years old it now is. yeah um we'll we need to bond off this year <laughs> we need to um start doing some bigger upkeeps i mean we do the minimal that we have to um but like the floor the inside floor is starting to crack um so we're, we're looking at trying to to resurface that to hold off the cracking um, just the, the greater barn hasn't been painted since I've been here and it's close to 14, 15 years, 14 years. So, um, just trying to do more, uh, cosmetic stuff to keep it from starting to rot. So, um, so there's the increase there, whether we opt to do it, start doing it this year. I mean, that's up to you guys, but, um, I don't have absolute numbers um, just because I haven't been back to work for um, very long before this needed to be done. So um, I gave a rough idea and basically if we get money to do something, we'll do what we can with the money we have and then we'll proceed and go from there. Yeah. So. The, the highway garage itself, the, the metal building, it's 20 years old now, um, and there's some things. When I first got this budget, I toyed with, well, should some of this go into the infrastructure CIP? But it's really, it's, it's not really anything that's a capital project. It's mostly maintenance of, of what we have. Um, so I think we can keep it in this budget. Are we talking about just basic uh, cosmetic stuff, or is there any reconstructing of any parts of any? I don't think there's any reconstruction at this point. I mean, I think if we can get ahead and, like, as I say, like paint. I know that some of the wood paneling on the greater barn, the lower stuff where the water hits it needs to be replaced, and then just put a new coat of paint on it. And the roofing's all good. The structure is fine. It's just. I mean, if it keeps getting wet, then eventually we will have to do more. Um, I think it's all mostly yeah. maintenance, Chris. There's I mean, at no some point, the, the windows in the highway garage, we should take a look at replacing. Um, but at this point, it, I mean, 20 years, like I had said when we discussed the bonds of this place, you know, the 20, 20 year bond versus the 30 year. You know, I said in 30, in 30 years, people would be, you know, 25 years, 20, 25 years, that's about, some, about the maximum length of time there that a building, any type of wood structure can go before it starts to, you have to start yeah. you know, replacing it work and uh, other things. So it's, it's right on schedule, I guess. Right. Well, yeah, and the highway garage is a steel building, right? Yes. And, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I'm talking about the other outbuildings. So. No, no, I understand. Um, you know, on the, there's a few panels where, on the highway garage itself, that it's rusted. Yes. And, you know, you see a little air through there. So, you know, it needs to, needs to be replaced. But it is a, a little bit of a jump up from last year. And uh, I think, you know, we, we clearly, we need to do it. Um, 
let's see, building maintenance. Going down that column, um, street lights, that's just a factor of Green Mountain Power rates. Equipment maintenance, vehicle maintenance. Um, so a little bit, both of them are a little bit higher than last year. Um, <clears throat> on the vehicle maintenance, we may as well mention this now. Um, if you remember in 2018, we had planned to buy two new dump trucks. Um, regular, uh, what, six, six, wheel, six yeah. wheel trucks. And they were both you know, about 120,000 each. Um, we didn't plan to replace the sidewalk plow for $150,000 last year, but we did. We, you know, we had to, we didn't have a choice. Um, so we spent more in our uh, highway vehicle fund than we thought. One of the trucks, they were both ordered at the same time, I believe, weren't they? So we ordered both of the dump trucks at the same time. We got one of them when? In November? October. October. Second one we haven't received yet. Uh, they're still building it. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so that's, that will become a 2019 expense. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> in this packet of information that Celia gave to me, <clears throat> this is the year the tandem dump truck is supposed to be changed. And the straight price without any trade is 190, I think. Um, I asked Celia if that's we. That's all fitted up. Excuse me. Yeah, yeah, that's yes. that's everything, and 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 we'll be you know we'll be able to sell the existing vehicle and get a a fair you know either trade or outright sale on that. I asked Celia though if we could <coughs> um, push the tandem to 2020. Uh, I'm not. Absolutely certain that's what I'm going to recommend. We'll review the, the infrastructure and the CIP budgets uh, in more detail either the next week or the week after. But I put her on notice that because the sidewalk plow got bumped up a year uh, and it wasn't really, you know, kind of bit us by surprise because we put it off a few years ago. It was ready to you know, be replaced and we didn't do it. So um, <clears throat> this vehicle maintenance line is probably lower than what Celia had. And maybe it's the same. Yeah, she asked for $30,000 for vehicle maintenance and I carried $30,000 for vehicle maintenance. But I, when, when I asked her if we could keep the tandem for another year, she said, well, yeah, I think we can, it's in pretty good shape, but there's things that, you know, tires maybe we would need to buy that we wouldn't have otherwise if we were going to trade it. Um, I guess Eric indicated that there's a little something going on with the transmission and if that went. So uh, we're not going to make this decision tonight, but I'm just letting you know that if we put it off, it could end up making that line item go higher. Is that truck a standard? Yes. Are you planning on next time around sticking with the standard? No, the driver wants an automatic. Probably be better. Yeah. For the driver, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So is that something a year from now you might be planning in the next budget to Yeah, I mean, it's still possible that I come back to you in a week and say, we got to do it. But um, yeah, we would put it off a year. But putting that off a year, I mean, it just kind of, it, it dominoes, you know. Yeah, you, yeah. It, we've got kind of a schedule, and, it's, it's and it's, a, it was knocked out of whack by the sidewalk plow, and now we're just going to deal with it. So <laughs> um, how, how does the purchase of the two smaller trucks fit into this 30000 It's There's nothing there that, that, that doesn't represent payments for those trucks. There's anymore. nothing here. The only, if you remember, the bottom line on this page on the highway budget, if you go down to the bottom, just before that dark line, you see the two capital fund, $533,000 gets sent to the capital funds. Right. And then the trucks are bought out of the capital funds. So the, whether we buy a truck or not buy a truck, it really doesn't 
impact this budget, except if we keep a vehicle longer than we thought, we might end up having some additional maintenance expenses on it that we didn't plan for. Yeah, I'm just trying to make a connection. Yeah, a conversation about the two new trucks. And because the, the, and the vehicle second vehicle. truck we're waiting for, if we had gotten rid of it when we thought we were going to, we've had a lot of additional Expense. cost mm -hmm. that we were, yeah. if, we, we, if we had gotten rid of it problem. prior to, we it wouldn't have, have been our that. cost, but <clears throat> yes, yeah, so. Chris, could you use your mic, please? Yes, dear. Thank you. I'm not sure, is it on, Chris? Yeah, it was. Yeah, mine was too, but it goes no, off yeah. after a little while, I think. Um, so moving down from vehicle maintenance, the diesel fuel line, where it says 60000 in blue, that will be the net expense for next year. That includes the roll-on of the WASI. Yeah, so no income in WASI up in the revenue, but the crediting of the WASI expenses, I mean, of the income here. So it's still up $7,700 from last year as far as the budget is concerned. Um, and, you know, it's a crapshoot. Um, some of these line items, I, I go back, um, you know, when we get to salt, I'll explain that. But I, I kind of do a rolling average and, you know, drop one year off, add another year. And, you know, there's just a lot of variables. It's not just the price of fuel. It's how long winter lasts. And, you know, anyway. Um, Public Works Director, that's just up a little bit. Um, I expect probably in the next couple of years that will go higher. Um, Bill is a water department employee as far as his pay is concerned. Alec is a water department employee as far as his pay is concerned. They both keep a, a spreadsheet and they tell me at the end of the year that Okay, they both, you know, Bill works 2,080 hours a year. Uh, that's what gets paid for. He probably works more than that. But I, have that I have that spreadsheet as I'm well. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be fair when I think about it. But anyway, um, uh, so Alec, I mean, both Bill and Alec will keep track of where they spend their time. So they spend their time in the highway department, water department, sewer department, recreation departments for this building. Uh, there's probably one that I'm- Cemetery, fire, fire department. department. Cemetery. Um, and, and then, you know, I take their compensation for the year, and then I apportion their compensation to the uh, same percentage that they spent their time. And for highways this year, um, Bill and Alec together, and, and what I do is look at what we paid them in 2018. So we're, this is retrospective. It looks back to what they what they worked last year and what they were paid last year, and then we we pay based on that. And then in 2020, we'll pay based on what they do in 2019. So in 2019. The Main Street project is going to ramp up, and I'm sure Bill is going to probably spend more time. So next year, this line will probably go higher than it is now. But that's how it's calculated. So oh. speaking of that real quick, is that money, do you know if that money has already been appropriated for that project to begin? By the state? Yeah. Yeah, as far as I know. I mean, so the federal shutdown not going to yank the rug out on us? Well, we haven't been told that yet. Uh, what, you know, I, I'm not in a position, I don't have the information. I That's what I was know. wondering. Um, everything that we hear, you know, the contractor was in last week, he's coming again next week, I mm -hmm. think, to meet with, mm -hmm. with our staff. Um, it seems like the state and the contractor are moving towards starting in April. If the shutdown is still going on in April, we might find out something that we don't know now, but uh, let's hope so. So moving down from here, this is where things kind of get a little bit um, more out of whack from what Celia put in here. So um, going down to 
contractors, Celia. Did I come close to putting what you had in there for contractors? You had 22.5, I put 18. Um, I put 19.5, same as last year. Um, I think we can live with the 19.5. We'll, we'll work it out. Um, but if you drop down to uh, salt, before we do that, yeah. can you just uh, touch base a little bit on what contractors represent? Just that's nothing to do with uh, so, hauling. No, that's no different. That. That's yeah. just a yeah. whole different. Yeah. Contractors I use for corrections, doing our additional roadside mowing. Okay. I see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh. Thanks. Sorry. Yeah. Um, how old did we, how many weeks did we have the mowing machine last year? Two. And you bumped it up a week this year? I would like to, yes, if. Okay. Um, Chris, this isn't the time for it now, but we'll talk about vehicle purchases and stuff at, at a future meeting. But, and they're made, you know, I'm not trying to open a Pandora's box, but you asked me a couple of years ago, would we be better off buying a mowing machine as opposed to spending $9,000 a year? I don't know how much one costs, but after a certain number of years, you pay for it. But it's another vehicle you have to put on your vehicle replacement schedule, and it's another one that you have to maintain. The last mowing machine we had was the uh, sidewalk plow that we used over the Yeah, road. and that was before me. Okay. Yeah. We haven't had anything since I've been here. Because, <clears throat> you know, Howard Ripley used to do it with his own tractor first with a sickle bar. So yeah, I, that's yeah. how they used to do it. Yeah. And then we moved to the blue behemoth there that we had for a number of years. And <laughs> he used to love to put up like this and mow the trees. Yeah. Uh, that, that looked great. Um, <laughs> And then we moved to that. Was that the, it wasn't the Velos, it was the track. track. It was the trackless. Yeah. Trackless. And is that attachment, we bought a trackless last summer. We didn't buy that attachment. No. Do they still have those attachments? They do, yes. Okay. It just puts a lot of extra. It really torques the machine. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if we were just to use it for a little bit here and there, that'd be one thing. But it's a very expensive attachment to do that, but it's, I mean, it, it's our main sidewalk machine, so I'd just assume not overtax it. Right, I'm not suggesting yeah. that we should. I'm just, I was just asking, do they still yes, offer they do. that attachment? Yes. But anyway, you had asked me a couple of years ago whether we should think about buying it. I don't think this is the year that we should, but anyway, it's a question that we should probably address. Yeah, it, I mean, it's just simple math. I mean, if, if you're spending nine grand a, a year, what's the, what would the payment be? And this is, yeah, the nine grand, yeah. well, this would be the first time we spend that because up until this year, we've only been doing it two, two weeks and... Um, yeah, but it's, yeah. I mean, if it's three weeks, it's $3,000 a week. Right, but if it's over the last three years, it goes up $400 every year. So it's taken a huge jump as far as that goes, but yeah. But I mean, that's what right. the cost is, $3,000 right. a week, right? So next year, we could, if we do it three years, three weeks, we could probably look at ten grand um, with the, the, the way they've been increasing mm -hmm. their rental fees. So yes. I mean, if we mortgaged one out, we had it ourselves. Yeah. I mean, what's the cost of that per year versus what we're spending every year? I mean, year? for for a tractor and a mower for what we need, we're probably looking at nine grand, ninety grand, to get a brand new one. If we look for a used one, but then you always have issues with used ones. So it depends on what. So anyway, yeah, that's a discussion for another me, day. But it's yep. just, it's just, you know, as the price for this rental goes up, it becomes a question that you want to ask more, more often, I guess. Okay, so that takes care of that. Um, bridge culverts and stuff like that, that's uh, normal. I, I'm sure I budgeted less than she did, but again, we didn't spend anywhere near as much as we thought we were going to. Um, salt. So Celia, uh, why don't you talk about salt? You can see on Celia's page, she budgeted $62,550 for salt. 
I budgeted um, $51,500, which is a big drop from what she budgeted. It's a huge drop from what we spent in 2018. We spent uh, more than $20,000 more than we budgeted in 18. Um, and uh, so if it was so far over in 18, why do you think we could get away with so much less? Well, it's it's just guessing what the weather's going to be like. Yeah. So um, you know, this is one that I do those rolling averages on, Jane. Yeah. So the average, even including the seventy thousand dollars that we spent this year. Um, it's still the average for the last five years is less than 50. Okay. And the year that dropped off was actually one of the higher years, so we replaced the high year with a high year. Mm -hmm. But there's a couple of years in the past five that we spent like 43. Right. Um, okay. And, and as I said, winter lasted longer in the spring, and it came a lot earlier. In, but mm -hmm. It also has to do with the, how the winters like, if it's zero degrees for four weeks of your winter, you're probably going to use less salt than if you it's don't use salt, yes. 25 no. degrees, right. right? Yeah. So the winters are changing, so it's, it's, it's a hit or miss if we get a, a real winter where it's cold all the time, mm -hmm. then salt usage is down. We get a warm winter or warmer winter. Um, you get frozen rain like we had right, right before Christmas. Yes. And then you've got a salt. Yeah. Well, last week here, um, I had mentioned to the board that I had wanted to have a, a serious discussion about our salt and sand use. I know it's a touchy subject with people. Um, I just want you to be assured that I'm not after anybody here. Uh, I have a genuine concern about the amount of salt and sand that we use in this entire state. It's not just the town, because everybody does pretty much the same thing. Um, there's a lot of factors involved. I mean, I'm smart enough to know that uh, our weather is changing. Um, our, our weather reporters these days exaggerate these storms to make it like it's the last day on earth. <laughs> oh, help me God. Um, uh, the public, uh, I know part of the problem with the, with the highway department is they don't like to hear the calls from people. Um, the other issue, and again, I'm not after anybody here. It's not a battle I'm interested in uh, taking up tonight. But with any, uh, with any business or some businesses, but uh, this is the time of year that uh, employees of municipalities and state government uh, have the ability to make extra money by accumulating overtime. Um, the concern there with me is not so much that they're working the hours, uh, it's more the concern that in the winter, there isn't a lot to do. You've got a full-time mechanic. I know there's other things that can be done, cleaning up the shop and organizing stuff, but well, let's face it, there's a limited amount of that that, that uh, has to be done, too. Um, I know that you have to uh, cater to the buses. I know all this. I'm just, so I'm, I'm not, this conversation isn't just, I'm not just picking it out of my backside here. Uh, I witness a lot of what goes on and uh, I just so what happens is I think sometimes when the guys are sent out to check roads um, and it's a mentality that's just been developed over a long period of time because this is the way we do things uh, when they go out to check roads sometimes a lot of the time it's my speculation that they don't always come back with as much as they probably could come back with um, for a couple of reasons. Part of it is they probably feel like if we don't get rid of this load of dirt or salt, uh, we're not doing our job. 
again, they don't want to hear people bitch. Um, so I'm just, I guess my question is, is there anything that we can do different, not only from an environmental side, uh, but from a budget standpoint as well, to uh, do whatever we can to curb the amount of salt and sand used uh, to try to make a difference on both on both fronts. Um, I know that's a tough question. Um, myself, I guess, having grown up here in the state, I don't need all that. But well, apparently, a lot of the public does. And, and that's the, the biggest problem. Do I think we can use less? Certainly. It's, it's just a hard situation to... I mean, can you just imagine this? And I don't, you know, I had one of the highway guys overhear me one day when I was talking to some of the boys at the coffee shop about this particular issue. And it may have been pertaining to the state. He looked at me and said, I thought you were a Vermonter. I was really pretty shocked that that came out of his mouth because I looked at it like this. I said, because I care about the environment and the state that I live in, but no longer a Vermonter. That was really, and I never forgot it. You know, it's like, you gotta be kidding me. Um, my son sent me a video, video just uh, yesterday, day before yesterday. He was headed to Morrisville, and he's got one of those cameras there in his truck. He sent it to me. Uh, it was a state truck that was in front of him. And uh, I, so help me God, there was a patch of snow this wide right there, just as you're going up by um, Fairfields. He was dumping salt, pouring it on. Um, absolutely, the rest of the road was completely clear. And my son couldn't believe it. And uh, then I was talking to one of the um, upper administrative officials, I guess, in the Agency of Transportation. He's no longer there. He just got done, went to work somewhere else here. And uh, we were chatting. I talked to him a little bit about why he got done, uh, from what I understand from one or another top official, that the Agency of Transportation is falling apart at the seams uh, at the state level. Um, but he mentioned several different times the, the uh, policies that are in place in this state. Mm -hmm. Uh, one official, one top official said, if it's snowing, I want to see water running. Uh, so I guess my question to everybody here is, how, how would you like it if every glass of water you drank, somebody dumped rock salt in it? Something to think about. Um, the impacts that I see to the to the brooks and streams and and all the invasive species that are growing along the reds of the roadsides, I could contribute it to all this excessive use, and I don't know what the answer is. Uh, somebody, I, I believe that at some point in time, that the state is actually going to say we need to set a policy that's mm -hmm. going to curtail it. Yes, curtail it because uh, we just yeah. our environment can't deal with it anymore. But unfortunately, with all the outer staters we have, the, the people that move into Vermont who expect to get services like they do from wherever they came from, it's not as easy as it was 20 years ago. The, and as I said, the winters are changing, so the temperatures are affecting how we have to maintain the roads. Whereas if, if it was this cold all winter long, we wouldn't have to use hardly anything. But because we're averaging above freezing, as soon as traffic rolls on it, it ices right over. So that's unfortunately one of the issues why we're using more. And because we can't regulate who drives on the road or regulate that they are required to put real snow tires on or have a four wheel drive or whatever, um, we can't not put stuff out when it's icy because the travel travels 
p people are going to get hurt. So I mean, of the, of the two evils, sand or salt, uh, I mean, I'd rather see sand down in, in more cases than, than salt, uh, if, if it, even to the point where if it's possible, uh, if the temperatures are going to warm up during the latter part of the day, if there's any chance you could use sand in the morning as opposed to trying to dump salt on there and making nothing but slime. Uh, I'm working on that. Okay. <laughs> That's all I'll say. <laughs> That's working on that. I appreciate it. I know it, and I know you're stuck with the task of beating it into the guys' heads. You got to make some changes here. Um, now, I know the state, because I had spoke to them here a year or so ago, this isn't something that I just mm -hmm. came to, you know, last week. It's been on my mind for a long time. Uh, I know the state offers a course in how to use, properly use salt and sand. You know, that's probably a waste of breath going to that class. So, I guess the, the job's in your hands, but... Uh, just if, if there's something that can be done uh, for two purposes, the environment and obviously for our budget, oh, yeah. because quite honestly, uh, when Bill's all done here, uh, the board's going to have a hard choice here on what to do with our tax rate this year. And, uh, you know, it may sound like I'm a pessimistic at, at times, but quite honestly, I believe I'm optimistic. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here trying to help out to you know make things better for everybody and uh, uh the budget i mean we just can't keep going back to the well you know it's uh, if you look at what's going on in, in the nation as as a whole this whole shutdown i was pretty surprised to see people who have been employed by the federal government for years they can't even afford to pay an additional months mortgage payment and vehicle payments because they just either either they're man, mismanaging their paychecks or they're really their backs are up against the wall everybody is stretched that thin in this country i mean that's frightening mm -hmm. uh, to see that everybody's living paycheck to paycheck like that and uh so the budget's important but i appreciate your time anyway Good luck with that sand. <laughs> Keep at it. Yeah, and then the last thing with the salt also is just the, you know, the impact on our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another our huge part. Decks, our culverts, our waterways. No, I, 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 those, I, things, I, those things get hammered in our trucks, yeah. you know? Yeah. I don't know if Bill mentioned to you there that I uh, was trying to, uh, put together something here. In fact, I made a few phone calls today, a few of the other uh, select board chairs in some different towns. I, I made a, quite a list there of uh, contacting some of these uh, chairmen to uh, see if they had any interest in uh, helping me out up at this, you know, I'm sorry, chair people, uh, up at the uh, state house to, uh, I guess, ideally I'd like to have one, one uh, elected official from every town show up up to the state house and talk about uh, a possible two cent gas tax uh, with the gas rate as low as it is right now to uh, raise revenues to uh, go strictly to the towns for pay, repaving roads and infrastructure. Um, one of the uh, chairman, chairperson uh, from one town suggested that uh, every town bring one of their uh, town trucks into Montpelier a specific, specific day to uh, try to get a point across. But uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty big uphill task for me to contact every uh, town in the state of Vermont, but uh, I think it's worth the effort. So we'll see where it goes. Okay. All right. I've said enough. Yeah, thank you. Um, and not to belabor the point, but again, uh, I joked with Celia and Bill today. Uh, if I had a nickel for every time one of the highway foremen who's worked for me has told me that we're going to run out of sand before the winter's out, I'd, I'd have about you know three dollars by now. But uh, 
there is concern. You know, we used a lot of material in the first part of the winter here. And, uh, you know, I cut the sand budget down to about what it was last year. Um, I'm, I'm not playing chicken, and I, I, I don't want to take a bet or anything, but I'm hopeful that we don't run out of sand and we'll be able to, you know, I think she's good in her budget to how many yards more? 500? Just 500, 500 yeah. more. So anyway, um, so having said all this, uh, if you go to the bottom of the page, you'll see that the budget for 2019 that I proposed, and I admittedly have cut line items from what Celia asked for, uh, $1,640,000, which is $15,600 more than we budgeted last year, and only about uh, $6,000 more than we spent last year. Um, that is a 1% increase in the budget uh, altogether. If you go up to the very top of the page, you'll see property taxes are up 10%, even though the budget is up 1%. And the reason for that is simple. You have to go back to the bottom of the page again to see the simplicity of it. We thought we came into the year with a $94,000 um, fund balance. Um, the auditor, whom I have not met with yet, had adjusted that somewhat. It was not quite as high as I thought, but um, we ended 2018 with almost 12,000 in the hole, and that 12,000 in the hole is probably going to go higher because we're going to get some expenses that get posted back. So, really, you know, even though we have almost a flat budget, we've got to raise $100,000 right now just to get back to where we were last year. You know, with the with the fund balance. You know, we, had, we thought we had 95, you take that 95 away and then you add the 12 to it. So, you know, our fund balance or the cash on hand is slower. So right now, the highway budget, if we pass this budget tonight <coughs> as is, and everything stayed the same, we're looking at a 10% increase in taxes in the highway department. Um, I'm not ready to say it's gonna stay there yet, I said a minute ago, could go higher than that. Um, we're not going to be able to make any decisions about the capital fund line item. I left it at $533,000 to transfer to the capital funds this year. I haven't had a real chance to get in and look at how the capital funds ended the year. I'm pretty certain that the paving CIP ended better than we thought it would. And I'm not suggesting we shouldn't put as much into the paving CIP as we have because we're trying to catch up. But um, we'll have to revisit that uh, next week probably. But right now, you know, from a budget to budget standpoint, if you just look at what we're going to spend, we're pretty pretty much flat. I mean, uh, and and we're flat by you know pulling some things out that they asked for. If I put everything back in that she asked for, that Celia asked for, I imagine that would be, you know, probably three and a half percent. I didn't do the calculations. I'm just taking a, a guess off the top of my head right now. Um, inflation is running about, you know, two, two and a half percent right now. So, um, you know, keeping the budget in that range is okay, and we may come back in a week or so and revisit this, and you may feel more comfortable adding something to some of these line items. But anyway, that's, that's all of the information I can impart at this point. So in a nutshell, if, if budget to budget, um, it only changes by 1%, but because we're not forwarding the, the surplus that we had last year, not able to, then that jumps it to 10%. Right. Any questions from the board? Okay, so if you, I don't know if I 
what else I gave you in that packet. I know I gave you this, right? Okay. So um, just briefly, I'm not going to talk about them right now, but uh, the schedule, as I said, called for the tandem to be replaced this year, one pickup truck with a file of sander to be replaced in one of the uh, mowers for the, that we use in the parks and the cemeteries. Um, I'm not sure you mean that. I didn't. Oh. Uh, I'm just, I said I didn't get to it. Um, so anyway, we'll talk about that uh, at next meeting or the week after, uh, but I'll, I'll bring that. Now this page that you do have, um, that is a memo from Alec to Bill Woodruff. This is dealing with uh, infrastructure and paving. Um, now remember, not so much from a cost standpoint, although it will be in our infrastructure budget, we're going to have an expense for Main Street this year. We don't yet know what it's going to be. Um, what they told us going into the bidding process, the way that the state expected the work to be done, uh, our guess would be that we'd have a higher expense in water and sewer in the first year, uh, and then a bigger expense for the highway in the second year because they got a, we, we thought they were going to do the whole street. Um, there's some discussion going on uh, with the contractor about you know doing it differently. We don't know yet. Um, we're in a fortunate position in that our, our responsibility for the whole thing is two percent, and uh, I, I you know it's between water, sewer, and highway. It's slightly more than four hundred thousand dollars over the course of two and a half to three construction seasons. Um, Bill and Barb and I have been working on separating water, sewer, and highway. I don't have that number with me tonight. Bill might, but I don't think we need to get there. There'll be something in our infrastructure budget to cover Main Street expenses this year. I don't think we're going to have to go out for a bond to do it. I don't think we need to have a special appropriation by the town to do it. Uh, because it's going to be over a, the course of three years. And I think we'll be able to fit it in. But the thing that will be a cost to us a little bit is staff time. And I don't mean that it's going to cost us dollars. Our staff is going to work the amount, same amount of time you that they usually work. I just issues. mean, you know, they're going to have to spend more time watching and observing and being involved in Main Street so we might not be able to do as many other projects as uh, we might if we just had to worry about money. So this first page, there's three bridges here, um, and I think we can actually take it down to two bridges right away. Uh, bridge number 47, which is listed at the bottom of page one, is this bridge here on Main Street. We discussed that last year, but we really can't do that now. Bridge four on Guptill Road, that's what we call the, you know, Dr. Murray Bridge, uh, right near his uh, entrance to his house and tree farm there. And then the Bridge 33, Armory Drive, that's the bridge as you leave Union Street right here in the village to go up to the uh, existing armory. Um, and they are shown here in the order that we would do them if we can only do one. So bridge four on Guptill Road would be the first priority, and then uh, Armory Drive, the second one. Um, it's, uh, we will apply for a structures grant. Uh, we definitely will not get two structures grants. So, you know, if we decided to do both, we would only get a grant for one. Uh, and we're kind of speculating that given the fact that we've got Main Street reconstruction going and uh, that it might not be Waterbury's turn to get a structures grant anyway. Mm -hmm. So we may not get any grants for, for bridge work. 
Um, whether we get a grant or not, I think, you know, reserve the right to change this recommendation, but I think we can do the one on Guttel Road, bridge number four. Um, that's a priority of the two, and it's also out of the village. I mean, Union Street is going to be used as, you know, people are going to be bypassing Main Street. So working over on Union Street might not be any easier than working on Winooski Street, though, right? That's correct, yeah. So, so to me, if we're going to do any of these, I would do bridge number four. I did instruct Bill, if we go ahead with this, if the select board does put it in the budget, we will apply for a structures grant for it and see what happens. Um, if you turn over to page three, and it says 2019 possible paving. Uh, and again, I haven't had the chance yet to do all the inputs and outputs of the paving CIP last year and what the fund balance is. But um, Loomis Hill, we did from Maple Street to the bridge at Thatcher Brook last year. Correct. Uh, and we, we um, changed all the culverts up to Hubbard Farm Road. Correct. And mm -hmm. we have three culverts above Hubbard, Hubbard Farm Road that we would do this year before the paving project. Two of them are fairly large, one just above Hubbard Farm, right at Calvin Potter's house. Yeah. And then uh, one just a little bit further up the hill than that, right? Yes. And those two are fairly large squash culverts. Yeah, 44 by 72 inch or so, yeah. And then there's a third culvert up the hill at Kellett's place. Yeah. Right? That isn't, uh, they're not, they're not, well, two of them are listed here. Uh, we've already bought the large culverts, the two yes. large ones. Maybe we have the other one too. Yes. Um, so Bill and Celia are suggesting that to do those, those two culverts would be about $50,000. Would we do the one up the hill ourselves? The smaller one, yes. At yes. Kellett's place? Yep. Okay. So to do the one, almost 1 1.6 miles of Loomis Hill from the bridge to the top, right? That's, would go all the way to the end. Uh, that project would be very similar to the project that we did on Perry Hill a number of years Is ago it, now. Valley um, yeah. Yeah, I don't think and, it is, but I added. I don't want to promise this right. yet, but I, I think we can do that job um, and maybe not have to borrow any money to get it done. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you if I'm wrong next week when I, when I look at the, the other budget. When we did Perry Hill, we, we borrowed a half a million dollars to do it. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasonable reasons that you might want to borrow the money just because it will take a pretty big chunk out of the fund. And, but interest rates are going up a little bit now, and if we can avoid borrowing, uh, and then if we have to borrow in a future year, we would have to do it. Um, can I well, touch just, on Well, just okay. one last thing. Uh, the other roads here that we're talking about uh, if we can fit it in. We talked today, uh, Alec and Bill and Celia and I, um, Loomis Hill, uh, the East Street Mill and Overlay, and the Jenny Davis Overlay. We would do those. The Union Street, for the same reason that I don't want to do that bridge, I don't want to work on Union Street while Main Street is being done. So. Um, because it's going to be a lot of traffic on that road. Mm -hmm. So now you can ask a question, Chris. Okay, uh, one question before the one I was just going to ask. Um, we didn't reclaim Perry Hill, right? We just yes. Oh yeah, that was all reclaimed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I never went. I mean, it was never 
went through there when we we, 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 chloride. we, we yeah. uh, milled out did we actually take stuff away no we? we had oh, to add we some on the hill up there we and chewed it in added chloride and rolled it in and then built the, the base up again and they burned up their teeth on the reclaimer because the asphalt was 16 inches deep in spots and yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. well it increased the grade a little bit yeah 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 <laughs> Yeah, because the machine counts on it going into dirt to cool off, and it was just not getting below there when the asphalt and spots of that hill were, had spots, been paved yeah. over yeah. and over and over. Yeah. yeah. Um, more on money. Um, didn't you tell me at one point here, back, remember a few years ago when I was talking about the, our pavement issues there? And, it's something to the effect that we could just borrow 25 million and get it over with. Uh, did you ex did you tell me one time that that wouldn't be possible because towns not allowed to borrow more than they can spend it or more than they can do in one year? Or is there what's the what's the story? Yeah, that, on that? I mean, 25 million would be a, a big stretch for us. I mean, we'd have to you know. Um, I don't. I remember the question. I don't remember the full answer that I gave to you. Um, First of all, uh, you can borrow money and, and not spend it all in the first year. Um, so when we first established the CIP fund, the fund 30 and every one of our capital projects was in it, we actually borrowed like, I think it was $600,000 to seed the capital improvement fund. And in the first year, we probably only spent 250 and we left the 400 in there to Earn interest, and then we, you know, spent it down the road. So you, you, you don't have to use it all in the first year that you borrow it. But after the most recent uh, financial crisis of ten years ago now, 2008, 2009, um, they they have changed the rules, and it's much harder. They used to give you your money all up front, and you could take your money and you'd start paying interest on it as soon as you got it, but you could invest it and then, you know, build your project and have it over time. Now, through the bond bank, when we built this building, when we, um, when we, I think when we did the, well, not, not the Perry Hill job, but when you borrow money now through the bond bank, what they do is they only let you, uh, it's reimbursable. You, you do the work, and then when you're going to pay the contractor, you call up the, the custodial bank and you say, well, you don't call them up, you send them an email, and you got to fill out this paperwork, and then you say, okay, we're going to be paying our contractor $200,000 next week, send us the money. Um, and you're paying interest on it, and I did work to invest it, but it's not anywhere near as easy as it used to be to get money in a, in a lump sum and, and have it. So I guess my, my question to you is, in the board, projecting out the next few years, the infrastructure issues, if something doesn't come to fruition with the state or any other fall into a bucket of crap and come out with some new revenue source to help us out here, uh, with the fear of interest rates continuing to climb, does it, you know, how much have we lost by not doing something back when I said, uh, and do we still have the potential to save ourselves a lot of money if we were to borrow a lump now, lock in our interest rate now, and just, uh, you know, a pretty good possibility is that the rates are gonna climb here uh, in the foreseeable future, yeah. How much could we save ourselves, and you know what benefits might might come from thinking along that line? I guess. Yeah. Well, I I, I don't know, um, and uh, part of the difficulty is you know how much can can we actually do in any given year, you know. Uh, uh, when we do a project like uh, Perry Hill was, or like Loomis Hill is gonna be, 
and a bridge project and we got Main Street going on. I mean, there, there's a limit to how much we can kind of supervise and plan and get ready for. Um, and, you know, borrowing money is, I'm not against it. I mean, I feel a little bit like you turn the tables on it because usually you tell me you don't want to borrow. No, I, I think about a lot of different things and, and you know, faced with, faced with the road repairs and bridge repairs that we're going to have coming, uh, as the interest rate climbs, the ability for us to raise the taxes enough to pay those extra interest rates. Well, you know, I guess I'm I'm but, the, I'm but, just throwing the question out there. What right, but, what are the differences, so and do we, do we stand but, a better chance? But handling? I think as the interest rates climb, and they've gone up considerably since what they were three years ago, borrowing money and not spending it and holding on to it is it's not worth it yeah. because you're going to pay 4% to Increase hang costs. on to that money and you haven't done anything. So I think, you know, you can still borrow. It's just borrowing it incrementally. And, uh, you know, um, historically rates are still really low. I mean, they've gone up from what they were a couple of years ago. But, you know, when I came here, in, in 1988, the, the prime rate was, you know, up there. It was pushing, you know, 8 9%. And when I bought my first house on Loomis Hill, I had to get a variable adjustable rate mortgage like at 7% because a fixed rate was, on 14. you know, 10 12%, mm -hmm. something like that. You know, when ben, ben and Jerry's borrowed the money from the village to build their plant, the village lent them $650,000 from uh, the CDB, from the UDAG fund that the village was granted. And, you know, Ben and Jerry's, that was a rock bottom low interest rate. 10, 9 percent is what they paid back. So interest rates are historically still low right now. They're going up, but nowhere near what they have been in, in Times past. Yeah. Uh, well, let me ask the question in a little bit different way. Um, given what we've got that we're looking at um, with you know available man, um, hours hours available bandwidth of the administration and um, with the reconstruction project and what you've got laid out for paving, what percentage of max capacity do you think we're at with what we've laid out for 2019? Well, he's probably in a better position than I am to, to figure this out. Um, you know, we've talked about it. Nobody, nobody waved a big red flag at me to say that we couldn't do these three things plus Main Street. And there's, you know, there's water and sewer stuff, but Bill probably is in a better place. No, I, I think Main Street's just going to be an everyday grind that we're going to have to put up with. Um, the well, in terms of your time? And yeah, it, as well as for my time. Um, so while, just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but sure. while you're on that subject, uh, if this is, is this a, a federally funded project, right? Main Street? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, not all of it, but most of it. How federal, much of 3% yeah. state and 2% local. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, I mean, how much oversight from the state is? Oh, there'll, there'll be tremendous oversight from the state. So, they'll, I guess my question the is... The state has a resident engineer assigned to the project. They'll be, he'll be, be overseeing probably three or four or five, six other guys as well. Right. So, I guess but my it, question is, why, we, why are we it's going to be ours, requiring... And I think we want our eyes on it as well. I kind of figured that, but... Yeah, yeah. I mean, they will be there. Water and sewer. We yeah, so they'll be there all the time. But like I say, in the end, they're going to hand the keys right over to us, and it's going to be ours. So we want it done our way. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so why do the toilets flush up now? Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. Um, but with some of the paving projects, I think I don't think it's too ambitious. The the three bill kind of prioritized. Um, Loomis Hill will be a big project, and a lot of it falls on Celia's. But we've tried to. Um, push a lot of the other highway projects towards the center and knowing that 
Main Street's going to have a lot of action and, and what have you, and to, her crew would probably prefer to stay up in that direction anyway. Um, but I don't think it's too ambitious. But but I don't think we can do much more, either from a financial standpoint oh. or a planning standpoint. In other words, no. I don't think we can do Loomis Hill and Maple Street. No. Yeah, year. we're not. No, we're never yeah. ready to do Maple Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, whether it needs it or not, we're, we're not prepared to do Maple Street. We, we kind of set the groundwork to do Loomis yeah. by doing all the culverts last year and the first part of the road and what have you. And right. So the 50000 that's penciled in at the bottom here for Loomis Hill, that was... That's for the culverts. That's for the culverts. The two, yeah, the two big squat culverts. Thanks. And I'm not trying to second guess, you know, your planning no. and strategy. I'm just trying to come at it from a different way of, you know, if Chris says, well, what about if we just, you know, borrow a bunch of money and get a lot more done? Well, uh, you know, we, if, if we're at capacity, right. we're going to have to hire all that out. And are we better? better served to yeah. keep it in-house. The concept wasn't so much to, to get more work done this year. The concept was more to borrow cheap money while we had the availability okay. to try to save us some tax dollars down the road. That was... Right. You know, and, and you know, I'm not, again, I'm not prepared to recommend this yet, but, you know, we've spent a little fund balance this year so far. We've just talked about that. You know, we had a pretty good surplus in the highway department and now we've got a deficit. Um, but, you know, we also have the ability, fortunately, to, to borrow from ourselves to a degree. And that's, and, and we pay ourselves interest and we've been paying ourselves a premium of interest just so, you know, when we borrow money from the tax stabilization fund that we're actually, we're paying ourselves so if we can afford to do it, pay ourselves and, and build that up so it generates more revenue down the road, you know, we're doing okay. Last year we didn't have to do any tax anticipation borrowing um, for the things in the highway infrastructure and um, the fire department vehicles. We borrowed from ourselves, just advanced to and from other funds. So. We're still, in a sense, borrowing, but we're not borrowing and paying somebody else. We're borrowing from ourselves, and if we, you know, we can do that, that's, I think, the best situation that we can be in. So I'll be in a lot better position a week from now to talk about those kind of things, but I appreciate your, you know, that the, the bandwidth is a, a concern as, as, as much as the financing. Absolutely. Um, I just want to thank both of you and your crews for what you do day in and day out and appreciate the, uh, the thoughtful proposal that was put in. It's, uh, you know, we've got to do hedge trimming on a bunch of different things, but uh, the proposals were well thought out and well prepared, and I appreciate that. Thank you. So I'm done okay. with budgets for tonight. Um, I have a question. Um, are we meeting, like next week is Monday, it's Martin Luther King Day, so when's our next meeting? It's my first, we don't have that as a holiday. So when do we meet again? We're going to meet Monday next week and we're going to meet the Monday after. When you see this Monday? January. So we are meeting on a holiday. Yeah. Well, it's a holiday for you, but it's we're working that day, so it's not a holiday for us. Just want to confirm. Yeah. And I also wanted to say just about the Main Street project, whatever Main Street, that I appreciate, um, you know, the consideration that it was is going to it's going to be an effort because there's going to be a lot of unexpected things. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. So you just have to go with yeah. it. Thanks to you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So we need to go into executive yeah. session. Yeah. Motion for that? Yeah. I forgot to bring the two-part motion, but since there's only so you make the... I will I will make the motion that we move to executive session to uh, deal with a pending legal issue as number. Well.
Okay. I will second that. Okay. All those approved? Say aye. 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 And so we can let Ann tear down if we go into the other room. Thanks.